So you, what you're having right now has more protein than beef. It has more iron than steak, more omegas than salmon, more calcium than milk, more antioxidants than blueberries. Super meat. It is a super meat. The vitamin dose is part two of five. Top reasons against a vegan diet. We investigate protein, iron, calcium, B12, and a mystery nutrient. <laughs> is said to be lacking from an all-pure plant-based diet. Let's explore the different nutrients and how they interact with our human body in terms of illness and disease. And as we shall see in a few short moments, there is an optimal diet, including all the vitamins and micronutrients that you need through a plant-based vegan eat eating your way through this pyramid. At the top, we find our fats and essential micronutrients. Bottom, we see our proteins and alternatives. Next, we have vegetables and fruits. You should eat in a large amount. And the bottom includes grains and carbohydrates. The most we should eat in our day. Now, take these Americans. They look like a normal family, but in fact, they're not. It is the Campbells, Dr. Colin T. Campbell and Kim Campbell, his son, who have made the documentary Plant Pure Nation. The documentary explores the lives of countless Americans who are in a chronic health condition and entrapped by the American food industry with no reality of the cost of a poor diet that lacks plant foods. The popularity of this documentary is spun a Plant Pure Nation cookbook, which you can buy online through their websites. Let's hear what they have to say. Well, there's a lot of difference of opinion about it, um, and there are there's a faction of people who insist that there are different diets for different people, but I think that the evidence is fairly clear that that's not true, and there really is an appropriate diet for humans, just like there's a best diet for cats, dogs, elephants, and any other mammal. And the best diet for humans is one that is plant-based, almost all calories coming from four principal food groups, fruit, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. It's low in fat, high in fiber, not very much processed food. None is great, but in today's world, I don't know how realistic that is. What we have seen in nutrition for many, many years, I must say, is a lot of confusion. You go and survey people you know, outside of the science and ask them what do they think about nutrition is, and you can hear all kinds of comments. I eat this, I eat that, and this is good, and this is not good. There's also confusion in the professions. You know, medical doctors are not trained in this field. And there's confusion in my own field, you know, biomedical research. We don't get an opportunity to tell, you know, the real science, I think, the way it should be told, because we're overwhelmed with the corporate sector trying to sell stuff. We are living in extreme times where we have 27% of people dying of heart disease, 25% of cancer, 10% of stroke four or five percent from diabetes, the same number for Alzheimer's. I mean, these are, in many, many cases, diseases of nutritional ignorance and diseases that are all based on our lifestyle choices. There are a lot of different dietary theories out there, but I think one fact is kind of indisputable. Having a diet that is rich in whole plant-based foods is truly a great way to get you to good health. Everywhere I go around the world, there's not a single person I've met that doesn't know that fruits and vegetables are good for them. We all know it. It's not about the knowing, it's about the doing. There was a time when there was no heart disease, no colon cancer, no breast cancer, no multiple sclerosis, no inflammatory arthritis. Of course, these days in Asia, in the Middle East, in Central America, and around the world, people have become rich. They have uh, given up much of their starch and they replaced it with meat and dairy. Throughout history, rich people, the royalty, the pharaohs, the queens, the kings, the priests, the priestess, the people could afford to eat the meat. They had artery disease, they had obesity, they were sick. Nothing's changed except for the number of kings and queens living in the world. Kings and queens indeed. The number two reason, vitamin dose, people say, is protein. Where do I get my protein from? Well, let's first discuss what exactly is a protein. A protein is a set of particular amino acids that are formed in a sequence. 
Now, this table here represents the percentage of Americans with inadequate micronutrients. Protein is at the very bottom of the list. So most people meet their protein requirements, if not all of people in modern society. Researcher Kenneth Carpenter published in the Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 1992 the nutritional requirements of proteins from modern humans from an evolutionary perspective. He discovered that researchers found 6% of protein from your diet makes up all of your protein requirements for modern humans, whereas carnivorous cats and other animals require about 20%. Why is there such a popularity for protein in our modern society? Because as an evolutionary standpoint, this picture looks quite different. Normal food from single stomach tire animals has either been plants, fungi, and carcasses of wild animals. The practice of hunting wild animals as prey or domesticating, such as fattening or finishing them up with heavy grains, has been a modern development, as well as processing sugars, starches, oils, through the extraction from plant foods has been a modern development. Before then, we stuck to eating the entire plant, if not its parts, leaves, seeds, fruits, and tubers. How did we reach a point of eating the protein machinery of animals and plants, as well as their energy storages, without a demand for reproduction or growth? Let's check out what Dr. Greger has to say. There's been a history of enthusiasm for protein in the nutrition world. A century ago, the protein requirements were more than twice what we know them to be today. This enthusiasm peaked in the 1950s, and with the United Nations identifying protein deficiency as a serious widespread global problem. There was a protein gap that needed to be filled. This was certainly convenient for the U.S. dairy industry, who could dump their post-war surplus of dried milk onto the third world, rather than having to just bury it. But this led to the great protein fiasco. There was a disease of malnutrition called kwashiorkor that was assumed to be caused by protein deficiency, famously discovered by Dr. Cicely Williams, who spent the latter half of her life debunking the very condition that she first described. Turns out there's no real evidence of dietary protein deficiency. The actual cause of kwashiorkor remains obscure, but fecal transplant studies suggest changes in gut flora may be a causal factor. How could the field of nutrition have gotten it so spectacularly wrong? A famous editorial about the profession started with these words. The dispassionate objectivity of scientists is a myth. No scientist is simply involved in the single-minded pursuit of truth. He or she is also engaged in the passionate pursuit of research, grants, and professional success. Uh, nutritionists may wish to attack malnutrition, but they also wish to earn their living in ways they find congenial. This inevitably encourages researchers to make a case for the importance of their own portion of the field and their nutrient, which was protein. Science eventually prevailed, though, and there was a massive recalculation of human protein requirements in the 1970s, which at the stroke of a pen closed the so-called protein gap and destroyed the theory of this pandemic of protein malnutrition. Infant protein requirements went from a recommended 13% of daily calories down to 10%, then 7 and then down to 5%. However, to this day, there are still those obsessing about protein. Those promoting paleolithic diets, for example, try to make the case for protein from an evolutionary perspective. OK, but what does the science say about our daily recommended protein allowance? And are there risks of eating too much animal proteins? These fine-tuned over millions of years. Adults require no more than 0.8 or 0.9 grams of protein per healthy kilogram of body weight per day. So uh, that's like your ideal weight in pounds multiplied by 4 and then divided by 10. Uh, so someone whose ideal weight is 100 pounds may require up to 40 grams of protein a day. On average, they probably only need about 30 grams a day, which is 0.66 grams per kilogram. But we say 0.8 or 0.9 because everyone's different, and we want to capture most of the bell curve. People are more likely to suffer from protein 
excess than protein deficiency, the adverse effects associated with long-term high-protein diets may include disorders of bone and calcium balance, disorders of kidney function, increased cancer risk, disorders of the liver, and worsening of coronary artery disease. Therefore, there is currently no reasonable scientific basis to recommend protein consumption above the current recommended daily allowance due to its potential disease risks. And you can check out Dr. Greger's website, nutritionfacts.org, his YouTube sources for informational videos, and his book on how not to die. All right, we are closing the discussion on protein and moving on to another micronutrient deficiency, iron. Iron is a micronutrient that is available in the flesh of animals commonly. It's also available in plants, stored in the hemoglobin molecule in the human blood in the red blood cells, which transport oxygen. This is concern for our diet because most women may be deficient in iron. As you can see, the upper tolerable limit, there is a peak of absorbed iron per day. The plant foods that have iron include beans, legumes, soybean products such as tofu and tempeh, nuts and seeds, and dark leafy greens. Beware as dairy and animal proteins may block the absorption of iron, but isn't dairy products at least good for calcium? Hey guys, shouldn't be giving me a hard time. I mean, I may not be so big now. But I'm drinking milk, because in these years I'm growing faster than I ever will again. And I need milk's calcium for bones. And protein for muscle, more now than I ever did as a kid. In fact, this is how I'm going to look when I'm 19. I don't forget a name or a face. I'll probably have forgiven you guys by then. But you never can tell. Milk, it does a body good. Only human milk is made for humans to consume. Dairy milk is never made for humans to consume. In fact, calcium from dairy is the opposite of building strong bones. Here's a study showing the occurrence of breast cancer with the inclusion of dairy products, including milk in your diet. Again, calcium for strong bones is not made by these deadly dairy products. And the scientists think so too. Dr. Colin T. Campbell is the author of the China study claiming that cow's milk protein may be the single most significant chemical carcinogen to which humans are exposed. Dr. McDougall is a plant-based doctor with years researching the dairy industry and about the death and dangers of dairy products. Well, the basic problem is, is that cow's milk was designed over, I don't know how long cows have been around, well, let's just guess, 20 million years cows have been around. For, for 20 million years, or their predecessors, however long they were around, this evolution has gone on to develop this ideal food for baby cows called cow's milk. And they do a good job. They, they grow baby cows very well, and eventually a baby cow weighs, as an adult, 1,000 to 1,500 pounds and stands about four and a half feet tall, and there are lots and lots and lots of cows in this country, like about uh, 96 million cows. So it's working out really well, this cow's milk is for cows. But cow's milk is not the right food for people. Milk is specifically designed for a species of animal. And one of the, one of the qualities of the milk is that it has to fit the needs related to growth. So let's take a look at some figures here concerning growth of an animal compared to the protein content, which is vital to growth. You've got to have protein involved in the growth process. Let's take a look at the protein content based upon rate of growth. And rate of growth here is the amount of time that is required to double the size of the animal. So human breast milk has 1.2 grams per 100 milliliters, and the growth rate or doubling time is six months. Horses, 2.4 doubles in size in 60 days. Cows, 3.3, doubles in size in 47 days. Dog, 7.1, doubles in size in eight days. And a rat, 11.8 grams per 100 cc's, and a doubles in size in 4.5 days. You see the connection there? This is a food that has a protein content ideal for an animal that doubles in size about four times as fast as we do. There are other nutritional qualities that fit ideally for a cow, but differ greatly from us. And that is the calcium content, for example. The calcium content of cow's milk is four times higher than the calcium content of human breast milk. 
fits ideally for growing a cow, but it was absolutely unnecessary to have that kind of calcium load to grow a person. If it was necessary, then human breast milk would contain that amount of calcium. And so it is with the other nutrients. Cow's milk is supercharged because of the fact that you need to grow this animal very rapidly to a very large size. Makes sense. Milk is sold to people in this country as the ideal food to build strong bones. Now, I need to point out to you that originally milk was sold to you based upon the calcium content. And everybody in this room knows that the reason milk builds strong bones is because it's filled with calcium. And of course, bones have a lot of calcium in them, so it makes sense, right? Well, there was a problem that's developed, and that is that scientists started to think about this a little bit and look at the research a little more carefully. And even consumers have looked at this, and they've they come to the conclusion that this really doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, the picture that you'd have to have in mind, believing that calcium is so important for bone growth, is you'd have to have this kind of thought process going on. You'd have to think, what I do to grow strong bones is I shove a lot of calcium in past my lips, through my esophagus, into my intestine, and if I shove it fast enough and hard enough, so I'll develop a high concentration in the intestine, which will push, push through the intestinal wall into the bloodstream and build up a high concentration of calcium in the bloodstream, and then it will get pushed into the bones and stuffed into the bones. <laughs> That's what you have to believe. You have to believe the gut is a passive sieve. You know what a sieve is? Something you drain your spaghetti with? A sieve. It, it has no no judgment, no control, just a sieve, and that's what the gut wall would be by shoving this calcium in, it just goes right in through the bones, into the bones. Of course, that's nonsense. Not only would that never happen in nature, but it would be deadly if it did, because if you consumed the gallons of milk and the handfuls of calcium pills that are recommended, you would die. You would die from soft tissue calcification. Your kidneys would be calcified, your muscles would get calcified, your heart would get calcified, and you would die. So what we have instead of this passive sieve is we have a very intelligent gut wall. It is so intelligent that when you do silly things like take these uh, large extraordinary amounts of calcium, it will block the calcium out and save your life. If you do something at the other extreme, which is to take a lower amount of calcium, say you just eat plant foods, rice, corn, oranges, potatoes, and so on. Well, it will do that gut wall. So it will go out and reach out into that food supply, and it will grab that calcium and pull that calcium in very efficiently into the blood, and it will always meet your calcium needs. Now, how do I know it always meets calcium needs? Because I have searched. The World Health Organization has searched. Uh, the United States government has searched for a single case of calcium deficiency caused by a low calcium diet. And we have all come up empty handed. There has never been a case of dietary calcium deficiency ever reported in the world literature. There is no such disease. And yet, and yet, billions of people live on diets that contain no dairy products, no Tums, no calcium pills, and they grow normal adult skeletons. How could they do that? You wouldn't believe that would be possible if you listened to the dairy industry, the calcium pill industry, would you? But, but your own observations say that what they're teaching you cannot be true. So if you find a case of dietary calcium deficiency, in other words, not enough calcium in a diet causes the disease, I'm the first one that knows, please, so I get to report it in the medical journal and become world famous. Okay, so the calcium bit didn't work, right? <clears throat> So the dairy industry now has to figure out another way to tell you how dairy products build strong bones. And those of you who are a little more sophisticated in this and have been reading the newspapers and, and some of the news articles, or more importantly, the medical journals, you will see that now the dairy industry, as well as the pork and the beef industry, have figured out how their products build strong bones. What they are telling you is the reason that these foods that are high in protein build strong bones is a direct effect of the protein on the bones. The bones cause, the protein causes the bones to grow stronger. And they have put millions of dollars into that research to show you that. And millions more into the media to get the publicity spin so that the public will know about it. Let me talk to you about these two issues for a few minutes. The dairy industry now has a new campaign. It's called a three a day. Three a day for stronger bones. Three dairy products a day for stronger bones. Do you know where they get that slogan from? You've heard of the five a day program, which is a really good legitimate program. It's now gone up to nine a day because they know five a day of fruits and vegetables really isn't enough, but that's what they started. Now they're up to telling you to eat nine a day. Pretty soon they'll be telling you something really radical like just eat fruits and vegetables. 
because that's what the truth is. Okay, so they have this three-a-day campaign. Look at what they're advertising. This is one of their slogans. They're not just advertising skim milk, are they? They've got cheese and milk and yogurt and ice cream and whatever. They're just anything. If you look at the ads to tell you to build strong bones, they're telling you to consume not just low-fat products, but any other products. Any advertisements you see for osteoporosis. And you might stop and think for a minute. You might say, now listen, I, I see a little problem here. I hear the Heart Association and other organizations telling me that I should avoid these high-fat, high-cholesterol foods because they'll give me strokes, heart attacks, adult-type diabetes, obesity, colon cancer, breast cancer. What a dirty, rotten trick to get a necessary nutrient, calcium, I have to risk my life. And you start thinking, maybe there's something wrong here. Maybe my creator didn't make a horrible mistake. You see the problem here? If you believe that the human being was designed correctly in an environment that is supposed to support the human being, then how could you have such a contradiction exist? How could you have a recommendation that will give you breast cancer and heart disease yet is necessary to grow strong bones. It makes no sense. Was our creator out to lunch? <laughs> Maybe at McDonald's. Maybe he had that cerebral disease that S was talking about. Okay, so that's the new plan, five a day. First thing I want to point out to you is that calcium is a mineral. It comes from the ground. Always remember that it comes from the ground. Calcium does not come from milk originally does not come from plants originally. Where it comes from is from the ground. All your minerals, copper, manganese, iron, potassium, sodium, all these minerals that you're so busy talking about and many of you are taking supplements for, all of these minerals come from the ground. The way they get into all animals is they dissolve in watery solutions. The roots of plants take these minerals up from these watery solutions, incorporate the minerals in the roots, leaves, flowers, stems, and uh, fruits, leaves, flowers, stems. Anyway, all the parts of the plants, and <laughs> it's got to be another part. And what we do as animals, or other animals do, is they go and eat the parts of the plants, right? right. No animal eats ground, <laughs> except for a two-year-old. So what we want to do is we want to get the minerals from the more original source. We're not going to eat ground, so what's the next choice? Plants. Plants are so sufficient in minerals that mineral deficiency is almost non-existent in the world with two exceptions. And those are iodine deficiency and in very rare cases selenium deficiency and maybe a third, maybe very, very, very rare cases zinc deficiency. But nothing you ever have to worry about. It's a very isolated situation. If you want to read more about the mineral and the vitamin issue, in last month's newsletter on my website I wrote about vitamins and minerals and why I don't recommend them. Okay, so that's where the original source of calcium is from. We should go to that original source. And as I mentioned, you always get enough if you go to that original source. Let's take a look at some of the recommendations that have been given in the scientific literature for our calcium intake. Just to help you focus on the problem here. If you look at the research that was done, the basic research, and the basic research, if you look at science and you study it as I have, and I've studied the science well over 100 years of science and scientific research, what you find is the really basic stuff was done back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. We build upon that, but the basic research was done back then. The basic research shows that a person, whether that person is nursing or pregnant, requires 150 to 200 milligrams of calcium a day. That's it. The average calcium intake in underdeveloped countries is 300 to 500 milligrams a day. Try and remember some of these figures. Calcium intake for the average American is 500 to 600 milligrams a day. World Health Organization. World Health Organization that's responsible for the nutritional needs of most people on this earth recommend 400 to 500 milligrams a day. But uh, industry-influenced organizations in this country recommend things, amounts such as 1,000 to 1,300 milligrams a day from the U.S. Food and Nutrition Board and the National Institutes of Health, 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams a day. Ask yourself, you see these figures, you ask yourself, well, how in the world could we have recommendations all the way from 150 to 1,500 milligrams a day? How could such numbers exist? The only way such numbers could exist is if calcium intake has little or nothing to do with the health of the bones. And that's what the truth is, and I'll show you how that works in just a second. The... 
the uh, dairy industry has influenced, no, excuse me, let me say it correctly. The dairy industry has paid for almost all of the research studying the effects of calcium on bone health. Thanks to Dr. McDougall, we now understand from a scientific perspective about calcium and dairy products. Where can we get calcium in plant foods? Here are the types of foods that are nutrient rich in calcium. Top of the list is sesame seeds. My personal favorite is tahini, which is a sesame paste. Soybeans and tofu products are the next one on our list, containing over 300 milligrams. Next one is almonds. Other nuts contain a high amount of calcium, as well as winged beans, green beans, French beans, long beans, dark leafy greens such as kale and collard greens, broccoli and oranges, especially useful when juiced. Let's take a look at some of the tactics that our modern media uses for us to eat dairy products. If you want to grow up big and strong, then buy my mammal utter juice products. They won't actually make you big and strong, but we've been literally saying they'll make your bones stronger for years and no one's questioned it. Yes, in its runny liquid form, this liquid cow teat spray pairs perfectly with everything from your high fructose flakes of corn to your sugary discs of fat or just by itself. Mmm, <laughs> so fresh you can still taste the animal milk sack that we squeezed this out of. Yes, this nutrient-rich ooze was meant for another mammal, but we'll tell you it's good for you by showing you that one athlete you like so much and put a glue that looks like milk on her upper lip. Right, athlete? Do you have this product? Oh, ho, ho, what a slogan! And all those sugary treats wouldn't taste good without my solidified udder fat. That's right. Most baked items, fried items, or generally cooked items use slabs of the fattiest part of the cow goo. Or sometimes you spread it on top of the baked things once they're done. Either way, we make sure that you're always eating it. Or you can have our aged cow titty goop. Depending on how long we let it get moldy changes what kind of fancy block of solid pus it becomes. And if we can't sell enough of it, we'll sneak the excess into your food without you knowing it. In fact, we made it possible for us to sneak it into a ton of food with some fancy politics. How do you think pizza companies made their crust taste better? It's all thanks to us. That's right. Even if you don't think you're buying my goo, you're buying my goo. But you're probably willingly buying my animal squishy glom because we crammed our utter goo agenda into your food pyramid or plate or whatever nonsense picture you subscribe to to tell you how to eat healthy. So you now think that you need this in your diet. Once we've brainwashed you to add my gloopy animal squirts into your diet, we've got you for good because these solidified cow nipple drops are physically addictive. That's right. When we mold our cow breast milk into these solid blocks of melty mush, it creates casomorphins, which is an opiate more addictive than morphine, <laughs> which is good for us, because if you really knew how we treat the cows whose udder drops we steal, you wouldn't buy it. It's horrifying and unhygienic and full of hormones and drugs and literal pus and animal abuse. Or maybe you do know all this, but you're too addicted to my solidified blocks of fresh squeezed mammal to care. If it makes you feel better to pretend that the milk tastes better when the cows are happier, we'll show you a bunch of cows in the field. But that's unrelated to our actual process. So drink and eat my creamy goo that's shot out of a larger animal's stomach. Cause look, it melts, which is somehow an appealing thing for eating. That's right, numb it up. I'm Roger, by the way, but you can call me the milkman. Now that we've finished our discussion on calcium, let's take another look at the biggest vitamin we have to find, vitamin B12. There is many confusion surrounding this molecule of B12. Am I obtaining enough? What are the right sources to obtain it? Let's check out what Dr. Greger has to say. Though it may be easier and cheaper to just take something once a week, some people would rather get into the habit of doing something daily so they don't forget. So how much would you have to take if you wanted to take vitamin B12 once a day rather than once a week? 
Using the formula we just learned, 1.5 plus 0.01 times the quantity of x minus 1.5 equals 4 to 7. Solve for x. All weights. Once a day, 250 micrograms or more is all we need. Uh, you can put an extra toothbrush to remind yourself, whatever it takes. The reason we can't absorb more than about 1.5 at a time directly through our receptors is that they get filled up. But it only takes them about 46 hours to unload their cargo into the body and are back in business. So if we got B12 three times a day, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we could absorb 1.5 each time and end up with 4.5 at the end of the day, which is all we need. And these kind of doses we can get from fortified foods. The so-called daily value on Nutrition Facts labels for B12 is 6 micrograms. So as long as each serving provides 25% of our daily value, then we can eat a serving of B12-fortified foods at every meal, and we wouldn't have to take supplements at all. So for example, there's vitamin B12-fortified nutritional yeast. A half teaspoon counts as a serving, so you could sprinkle that on uh, your meals. But that'd be like a dollar a week, as opposed to just a few pennies a week for B12 supplements. Uh, but whichever path you choose, and there's lots of various fortified B12 uh, fortified foods out there, uh, these are not just recommendations for people eating plant-based diets. They're recommendations for anyone who wants a cholesterol-free source of vitamin B12. This is not the only study to look at the arterial walls of those eating plant-based diets. This new study from China, for example, found that compared to omnivores, those that ate egg-free and meat-free diets, had all the typical benefits of eating more plant-based, uh, lower body mass index, blood pressure, triglycerides, total cholesterol, bad cholesterol, fewer free radicals, maybe better kidney function, better blood sugar control, etc. But does all that, all that translate to actual differences in their arteries? Yes, indeed the omnivores had comparatively thickened arterial linings, all of which suggests about a tripling in their probability of developing cardiovascular disease. They therefore recommend that you know, more vegetables should be eaten instead of meat, and it's never too late to improve one's diet. Having said that, if those on plant-based diets don't get enough vitamin B12, levels of an artery-damaging compound called homocysteine can start to rise in the bloodstream and may counteract some of the benefits of eating healthy. In this study from Taiwan, the arteries of vegetarians was just as stiff as those of om the omnivores, and they had the same level of thickening in their carotid arteries, perhaps because of the elevated homocysteine levels in their blood. The negative findings of these studies should not be considered as evidence of neutral cardiovascular effects of vegetarianism, but do indicate an urgent need for modification of vegan diets through vitamin B12 fortification or supplements. Vitamin B12 deficiency is a very serious problem, leading ultimately to anemia, neuropsychiatric disorders, irreversible nerve damage, and these high levels of you know, artery-damaging homocysteine in the blood. Prudent vegans should include sources of vitamin B12 in their diets. One study of vegetarians whose B12 levels were really hurting even had thicker, more dysfunctional arteries than the omnivores. How do we know B12 was to blame? Well, when they were given B12 supplements, they got better. Their arterial lining started to shrink back, and the proper functioning of their arteries returned. Without B12 fortified foods or B12 supplements, when omnivores are switched to a vegan diet, they develop vitamin B12 deficiency. Yes, it may take dropping down to around 150 picomoles per liter to develop classic signs of B12 deficiency, uh, like the anemia and our spinal cord rotting from the inside out. But way before that, we may start getting increased risk of cognitive deficits and brain shrinkage and stroke and depression and, and nerve and bone damage, as well as having our homocysteine shoot through the roof and that may attenuate the beneficial effects of a vegetarian diet on cardiovascular health. The beneficial effects of vegetarian diets on cholesterol and blood sugars need to be advocated, but at the same time, efforts to correct vitamin B12 deficiency in vegetarian diets can never be overestimated. Again, thanks to Dr. Greger, we need about 6 micrograms a day, whereas 
upper tolerable limit of B12 is like just excreted through your urine and too little can wreak physiological havoc. So what types of foods contain B12? Number one is tempeh, an Indonesian fermented and pressed soybean cake. Next, we have nutritional yeast grates for sprinkling a cheesy flavor. Oats and breakfast cereals of all kinds. Mushrooms, seaweed, including green, red, and brown algae. Spirulina, chlorella, and other microalgaes. All right, so just when we think of squash number two, the vitamin dose, as a reason against a vegan diet counting off protein, calcium, iron, and B12, we have to worry about a phantom vital nutrient that we're missing in our diets. Fiber helps in digestive health, lowers cholesterol, improves your glucose and blood sugar levels. Let's find out why it's an essential nutrient from Dr. Greger. When people think fiber, they think constipation. And it's true, if we could get Americans just to eat the minimum recommended daily intake of fiber-containing foods, we could save our country $80 billion, and that's just from the effects on constipation alone. Accumulating evidence indicates that greater dietary fiber intakes reduce risk for diabetes, heart disease, certain cancers, weight gain, obesity, diverticular disease, as well as constipation. So we need to eat more fiber-rich foods, which means eating more whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and legumes— uh, beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils. As fiber intake goes up, the risk of metabolic syndrome appears to go down. Less inflammation, and an apparent stepwise drop in obesity risk. And so, no surprise perhaps, that greater dietary fiber intake is associated with a lower risk of heart disease. 9% lower risk for every additional 7 grams a day of total fiber consumed. That's just like you know, some rice and beans, or a few servings of fruits and vegetables. How does fiber do its magic? What are the mechanisms by which dietary fiber may extend our lifespan? helps get rid of excess bile, feeds our good bacteria, changes our gut hormones, which collectively helps control our cholesterol and body weight, blood sugar, and blood pressure, which reduces the risk for cardiovascular disease. Reducing inflammation is a whole other mechanism by which fiber may help prevent chronic disease. The accompanying editorial to the fiber and heart disease meta-analysis implored doctors to enthusiastically and skillfully recommend that patients consume more dietary fiber. That means a lot of whole plant foods. If, however, we do buy something packaged, the first word in the ingredients list should be whole, but then the rest of the ingredients could be junk. So a second strategy is to look at the ratio of grams of carbohydrates to grams of dietary fiber. We're looking for about 5 to 1 or less. So, for example, whole wheat Wonder Bread passes the first test, first word is whole, but then it's like corn syrup in a chemistry set. Let's see if it passes the 5 to 1 rule. What you do is divide the carbohydrates by the dietary fiber, 20 divided by 2.7 is about 7. That's more than 5, so it goes back on the shelf. Better than white, though, which clocks in at over 18. Now here's one that makes the cut. 15 divided by 3 equals 5. Can do the same thing with breakfast cereal. Multi-green Cheerio sounds healthy, but as a ratio over 7, and then it just goes downhill from there. Here's an example of one that does make the cut, though sliding in under 4. The editorial concluded, the recommendation to consume diets with adequate amounts of dietary fiber may turn out to be the most important nutritional recommendation of all. concludes our number two vitamin dose we've crushed against the top five reasons to not go vegan. Discussing against protein, iron, calcium, B12, and the mystery nutrient of fiber. Next video, part three of five against the reason not to be vegan is our culture that plants are just not a part of my culture, or not enough, or not yet.
Check out my website. Links are below. And thank you for subscribing.